Well, thank you, George, for that reading, and good morning, everybody. Oh, it's always nice to be here at Myringi Bay, people of so many different countries. It's wonderful. And uh, one of the other things I like about uh, this church is uh, hearing your testimonies of what God has done in your life and how you met Jesus. And I guess with the baptisms coming up shortly, you'll have lots more of those wonderful testimonies, won't you? And uh, today I want to begin by sharing the testimony of another international person. His name was uh, Diego, Diego Costa. And those of you who are football fans will know that that's the name of a very famous soccer player. But that's not this one. And uh, Diego, I met him at Massey University um, uh, two or three months ago. And uh, I didn't realise when I was talking to him at first, but Diego had recently become a follower of Jesus. And uh, so I asked him, I said, um, can you tell me how that happened? I was really interested. And so um, he, and then I asked him, I said, could you come to Myringi Bay Community Church and share it with us? And he said, well, unfortunately, he went back to Brazil last week. So we just missed him, but he wrote it down, some of the highlights of his story, and he's given me permission to share those with you today. So I'm afraid they won't be in a Portuguese accent. Do we have any Spanish speakers, Portuguese speakers here? No. All right. Well, you'll have to hear it in an Australian accent, okay? But I hope you can understand what it is. And now, before he came uh, to New Zealand, Diego had led a what we call a privileged life, a good life in Brazil. He had a good job with a multinational uh, corporation and a beautiful girlfriend, and uh, things were going well for him. But listen to what he writes. These are his words. Things were going so well, but inside of me, I knew that there was something missing in my life. There was an emptiness that I tried to fill with many things. When I arrived in New Zealand, I was surrounded by students, like many of you today, and most of them just wanted to enjoy the good life without thinking about the consequences. Nightclubs, parties, drinks, drugs, sex, and then he adds, and energy drinks because he says um, the purpose of those was to keep them awake through the whole night and then they would sleep the next day. So I don't know what happened with their studies. I'm sure they failed their exams, some of those people. Anyway, Diego continues like this. He says, I soon realised that this life was empty and pointless, but I didn't know what to do. I decided I wanted to look for God. I wanted to know him for myself. So I started reading the Bible which is always a good place to start. I didn't have a clue about the structure of the Bible and where to start, and I couldn't understand very well, but I would not give up, he says. And then at, some, at that time, something amazing happened. He got a communication from a friend from Brazil, an old classmate from Brazil, who, who contacted him to say, I've become a Christian. So Diego says, I was so surprised but I soon noticed some big changes in his behaviour. He also started to share some Bible verses on Facebook and some videos about Jesus. I wanted so much to learn what had changed my friend. So the next holidays, I flew to the Netherlands, that's the other side of the world where this man was living now. He said, I wanted to see what he had seen. I wanted to learn what he had learned. I wanted to have a close relationship with God like my friend. He stayed there for 15 days. We studied the Bible together and prayed and watched sermons on the internet from when we woke up until night time. I can honestly say that those were the best days of my life. I didn't know how to pray before. I didn't talk to God. I didn't know that learning from the Bible and about Jesus would give me such pleasure, relief and satisfaction. And then he finishes up like this. He says, the word of God transformed my life. The way I see the world and my purposes in life. And I came back to New Zealand a new person. You like that? I came back to New Zealand a new person. I was born again in April, that's last year, and I was baptised. Great story. So that's a short version of something that happened to Diego. For him, this was a spiritual breakthrough. 
And today we're going to be talking and thinking about breakthrough moments in our life. Earlier we read, at least George read, about a breakthrough moment in the lives of Christ's first followers in Mark chapter 8. And here Jesus is starting to reveal more about what he came to do. And of course the effect of this is that it polarises people. People start to divide according to who they think Jesus is, like today, isn't it? So at this point, Jesus asks three important questions. You see, Jesus doesn't only answer our questions, he actually asks us questions as well that make us think. And the first question he says is this, who do the crowds say that I am? Who do the crowds say that I am? And of course, many people in the crowds were captivated by Jesus. They'd seen his miracles, they'd seen him heal people who were blind and deaf and who couldn't walk. They even saw him raise a dead girl to life. They saw him co command evil spirits to come out of people and to, to let those people be free. He had authority and he had authority also to forgive sins, didn't he? And so these people heard his teaching and saw the things about his life and they start to think. Some of them said, maybe he's a prophet. Maybe he's Elijah, the Old Testament prophet, and God has sent him back to us. And somebody else came up with the idea, maybe he's John the Baptist. Now you remember, John the Baptist was a follower of Jesus and he recently had his head cut off by Herod. Maybe God has sent him back to us, they thought. Anyway, so that was the first question. Who do the crowds say that I am? Now, second question. Jesus now turns to his disciples and he looks them in the eye and he says, what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? And it's an important question. And everybody here at some point in their life will answer that question. Who do you say Jesus is? And Peter, always the one to speak up first, says, you are the Christ. Christ, of course, means Messiah. And uh, Peter has seen all the things that the crowds had seen about Jesus and a lot more. And he is now convinced that Jesus is God's promised deliverer, the promised Messiah who they had been waiting for for centuries after centuries. And of course, Peter is right that Jesus is the Christ. But the next few verses actually show us something surprising. Peter is very confused still about how Jesus will bring in his kingdom. Because Jesus goes on to tell Peter something that shocks him, that amazes him. And this is what he says in verse 31. Jesus then began to teach them Notice this, please, that the Son of Man, that is Jesus, must suffer. He must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law. All the religious people will reject him, most of them, and that he must be killed after three days and after three days rise again. Well, Peter almost explodes. He can't handle this. The, the very idea... It is impossible, he says, that God's promised one who does all these things to free people and, and to show compassion for people, he, according to what Jesus is saying, is about to be disgraced, humiliated, mocked by people and eventually tortured and killed, as we know, on a cross by the people that he came to save, by the people he loved. Now, if you can picture it, Peter's angry about this. And in verse 32, it says um, that Peter takes him aside and begins to rebuke him. <laughs> can you imagine re telling Jesus off? Jesus, you're wrong. This is what he's doing. He, he's angry with Jesus. And Matthew's Gospel reports that Peter says, Never, Lord. This will never happen to you. This cannot happen. And you know what Jesus says? Jesus looks at him and he stuns him with these words. He says, get behind me, Satan. Woof. 
Can you imagine being called Satan by Jesus? There's an explanation coming. He goes on to say, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Can you imagine how that felt for Peter? What about times when you, when God shows you that you're completely wrong about something? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me. Completely wrong. So Peter's heart just sinks. But Jesus, of course, is not trying to be cruel to him. He's not trying to crush him. He just wants to open his eyes to see an important spiritual truth. And Jesus is saying this. He's saying that if you think that I, Jesus, God's promised one, can uh, win back God's world without suffering, that thought comes from the enemy, Satan, the deceiver, the evil one. But God's way is different. God's way is this. First, the suffering, the sacrifice for the sins of the world, and then the glory. Now, Jesus continues with a third question, and it's one that God used in my own life to impact me when I was the age of some of you, about 19 years of age, and I was a student, and I was considering my life and my future. And this question comes from Mark 8, 34 to 38. And I'd like us to read this out loud together now. And as we do so, watch out, watch out for the question that is in this. There's actually two that go together. So let's read it together. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet lose their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. All right, I hope you caught the question. At this point, Jesus puts in front of all of us two kinds of life. And the first kind of life is the tragedy of a life that is misspent, spent badly. And this is the most foolish mistake that you and I can ever make to live like, life like that. Jesus warns here about the awful danger of losing our soul, losing our soul. Now, when I was, as I say, 19, I was struck between the eyes by these two penetrating questions that Jesus asks. What good is it for you to gain the whole world, yet, yet lose your soul? And the twin question, what will you give in exchange for your soul? And those questions haunted me. I just couldn't get them out of my mind. Jesus is saying that to gain the world but lose your soul is the worst possible bargain that you can ever make in life. Now Jesus illustrates this in another part in the gospel and he tells a story. Jesus' usual way of addressing issues was to say, let me tell you a story. And he tells the story of the rich fool. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 following. Listen to the story. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store all my crops. Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. There I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus finishes by saying, this is how it will be for those who store up things for themselves but are not rich towards God. 
So why did Jesus call this man a fool? He was apparently clever, at least as a businessman. And God had caused his crops to grow well, but he couldn't see the big picture of how he could use his riches to bless other people and glorify God. And in the same way, Jesus is saying that if you and I try to hang on to life for our own sake, there is nothing surer than that we will lose our life in the sense that Jesus is talking about. Suppose we do well financially, and I hope we do. But if we do well financially but lose being part of God's good purposes for our life, what then? What have we gained? I want to tell you a story, a sad story, about one of my Australian uncles. A few uh, weeks ago, I was in Melbourne at my mother's funeral. My mother lived to 98 years of age. And um, while in Melbourne at the funeral, I, reminded, I was reminded again of this story that my mum had told me while she was alive about one of her brothers, my uncle Frank. And as a young man, my uncle had a strong relationship with God. He was keen to share his faith with other people, friends at work, uh, in special outreaches and so on. However, he came, there came the time when he fell in love with a, a very gorgeous and intelligent girl. The problem was he was captivated by her, but she had no time for God. And he wanted to please her. And as a result, slowly but surely, uncle slipped away from his commitment to Jesus. And you know, 10 years passed like that. 20 years 30 years, 40 years passed like that. And now as an older man, as he lay in his hospital bed, my uncle started to realise what had happened. And a friend who was not a believer in Jesus, but led by God, I believe, brought to him a pile of books that he got from a second-hand store. And in among those books was a modern translation of the New Testament. And my uncle opened it up. You know what he read? He read the words of Jesus. Whoever wants to lose, save his life will lose it. And what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And, you know, that encounter brought my uncle back to God. But he had this terrible regret. He told my mother, he said, I regret the years I've wasted. He wanted to tell his sons about Christ, but he said, they won't believe me now. One of them had become an alcoholic and had serious problems and so on. But I'm sure that at that point in his life, my uncle would have exchanged all of his assets in order to have life over again. You know, we only get, we only get one life, don't we? This is not a trial run. This is, this is it. We need to spend it well. And Jesus says, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? So he's, he's implying that you can't give anything in exchange for your soul. Because your soul is worth more than anything you possess or will possess. Your soul is priceless. Priceless. You are a treasure. You are a treasure in God's sight and you have the potential to last forever and to be part of God's purposes now as well as in eternity. Now I have a question for you to think about. What do you think it means to lose your soul? Now the word translated soul can mean life, but Jesus is not just talking about physical life, is he? He's talking about our ability to live in relationship with our creator and become the person that he designed us to become. But Jesus warns, you can lose that. You can lose that privilege and that opportunity. Firstly, there is a sense in which you lose, can lose your soul now. This means right now in your daily living that you can be cut off 
from the life that God designed you to have. It means, listen to, I just wrote down a, a list of things it means to lose your soul now. It means not to have God to strengthen you for the challenges of your life. It means not to have God to cleanse your conscience when you know you've done wrong and feel ashamed. It means not to have God to guide you in the decisions that you have to make about your studies, about your future, your ambitions, your families and so on. It means not to have God to comfort you when you are so sad about terrible things that have happened in your life and disappointments. It means not to have God to protect you against the schemes of the evil one, the devil, who is out to destroy people's lives. You know, I can't imagine living like that. The very thought of living like that, of losing my soul now, makes me shudder and tremble. If you gain the whole world but lose your soul, you have made a very poor decision and bargain. But you know, there's something even worse. And that is to be cut off from God and that relationship with him permanently, forever. When he fully brings in his kingdom. Because Jesus warns us in verse 38, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man, that is Jesus, will be ashamed of you when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels, when Jesus returns at his second coming. Jesus reminds us here that this life is not all that there is. History is not just going to drift on and on until we destroy ourselves, maybe by nuclear power. But there is coming a time when the... Jesus himself, at the climax of history, will physically return to earth and usher in a completely new age of history. And part of that, sadly, and we don't talk about this very often, is that that includes a judgment day. Acts 17 says God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. Romans 2 says God will judge our secret sins, the things that nobody sees. But that's just the bad news. Here's the good news. What a relief it is. What an amazing relief it is to understand this. That Jesus sacrificed himself. He suffered as he predicted in the reading. He sacrificed himself so that we could be forgiven and rescued from shame on the day of judgment. So, for us, that good news opens up a wonderful new opportunity and, in fact, it's an invitation that Jesus gives to all of us, isn't it? The way to find life in its fullness, the best decision you can make, Jesus says in verse 35, whoever gives away his life for my sake will find it. In John 10 Jesus puts it like this. He says, I've come so that you can have life, life in all its fullness, life that is full and full of meaning. There are some people who find life in its fullness. And surprisingly, these are the people who give their lives away for God and his purposes. And they find that what they were created for. So what does it mean, another question, to give your life away for Christ's sake. It means we come to a point in our lives when we ask him to take over the leadership of our lives rather than doing it our own way. And we put our future into his hands. And we do this because we believe and know deep in our hearts that he can make more of our life than we can. He knows what we're meant to be. And as a result, we commit all of our resources, our time, our money, our ambitions, our energy, our talents, to him, for him to lead us. And we consider that not a loss, but the greatest privilege that life can ever give us. So now, 
as our service comes to an end, I invite you, Jesus invites you, to make that commitment to him. You know, before Christmas, our friend Diego, whose picture you saw earlier on, he was at a beach barbecue outreach run by some Christians from Massey University. And they were singing down on the beach. They had the guitars. They were singing praises to God. And there was a strong sense of God's presence among them. And during that time of worship, Diego had a friend there from another faith but who didn't really take his own faith even seriously. He didn't have any real belief at all. And Diego said to him, you should get to know Jesus. You should get to know Jesus. And uh, Diego would say that to us today, wouldn't he? You should get to know Jesus. Do you know Jesus personally? When you wake up in the morning, are you conscious that he's with you? When you put your head on the pillow at the end of the day, do you know that he's been with you through the day? And do you pray for people around the world and people in your own family and circle? You know, maybe somebody here today is like my old uncle. And you're thinking, yeah, I've wandered away from God. I knew him closely, but not really now. Now it's a bit like same old, same old. I'm just going through the motions. If so, today, friends, can be a breakthrough moment for you as well. Today God gives a fresh opportunity to, to us, to every one of us, to kneel freshly before the King and surrender to him as the Lord and Director of our life. We're going to sing a song now if the sound people can put it on for us and it's a, it's a prayer song and the song goes like this, Jesus all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. All of my ambitions, hopes and plans, I surrender these into your hands. If that's the prayer that you want to pray today, you pray it, make this song your prayer. God will hear it. He's waiting for your response. He's opening to you the best opportunity that you've ever had. Thank you. So let's stand and sing this song from our hearts. Oh!
tell Jesus what's on your heart as we sing this last bit. you want to know Christ today or if you want to come back to Christ as Lord of your life I ask you please don't miss this wonderful opportunity that you have and straight after the service I invite you to come down here to the front and if God is speaking to your heart and we'd love to pray with you the pastors and some of the leaders of the church um, and also I have a little booklet that uh, if you're interested I'd like to give to you it's called Why Jesus and this is written by the founder of the Alpha Course. Some of you have done the Alpha Course and found it ex extremely helpful. This is written by Nicky Gumbel. He was a lawyer who became a Christian when he was in Oxford University and he became a pastor and wrote the Alpha Course. Why Jesus? It answers a lot of the questions and it'll show you the way that you can be sure that you belong to him today. So I've got a pile of those. I've got them in Korean and in uh, Mandarin and even one in Hindi. Um, and uh, those of us who are Australians can have the English one. All right, so let's uh, now as we go, let's uh, part with a blessing. Let us pray. Loving Father, you know our hearts, you read our thoughts, you know our struggles, you know the, the tension and the pulling both directions that we feel in our life just now. And we pray that you will help each one of us today to commit our lives completely to you and to know your blessing and your Holy Spirit coming in and, and leading us. And now we pray your blessing on our lives and families here in New Zealand and abroad. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Thank you. Please come and pray with us if you'd like to.